So Jack, thank you very much for taking part in our in conversation series. Um, we, we've been doing this now for about about five weeks. The very first one was with Professor John Curtis, and, and, and one of the questions we put to John was about um, the case for Scottish independence. And I think you know, every time somebody's interviewed, I know my case is always asked about Scottish independence, where it happened, the likelihood. What I find really interesting is that we had a poll that came out not so long ago that suggesting that support for independence is starting to decline and people are starting to look at the Scottish Labour Party in a new way. Do you, do you feel that the mood of the Scottish people is starting to change a little bit after 14 years of SNP power, all this talk about change and constitutional change, but not really delivering anything? Well, I think there's been a lot of reasons over the years for the shift in Scottish public opinion. It's partly been about national confidence uh, and the work of the parliament um, in the early years. I think, you know, really making a difference uh, built people's confidence and made them think about uh, the powers of the parliament and the, mm -hmm. you know, the potential of, of, of the parliament. But also it was partly um, an increasing distance between Scot the Scottish people and the Westminster Parliament and the government in Whitehall, um, which wasn't really countered at the centre. Mm -hmm. um, then in more recent years, I think what we've seen is when the Westminster Parliament has been dysfunctional, you know, over Brexit all these years, for example, we saw uh, uh, a rise in support for um, mm -hmm. Scotland breaking away, leaving the UK, which I think was partly a rejection of what appeared to be sort of chaos in government at the UK level. I yeah. It was like, why would we want that anymore? Um, whereas in Scotland, things seem very stable. You know, Nicola Sturgeon, at, at a decent majority, and uh, although there wasn't necessarily a lot happening in terms of policy, um, I think people, you know, were just appreciating a bit of stability and uh, mm. safe handling, handling in government. Um, and turning to that option. I think what we've seen now is uh, people thinking a little bit more about the purpose of government. I think over the past 12 years, 12 months, sorry, the last 12 months mm. in the pandemic, people are now thinking about what governments are for. You know, are, are, are governments there um, to just take a stand or to make statements or to, you know, battle with other levels of government? And that, that, this happens at all levels, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. or, are they, or are they there to actually help the economic recovery, the educational recovery, you know, improve the state of our health service, uh, and so on? Yeah. And I think these are, you know, these are very fundamental changes in public opinion. That, um, I, and I think the, the sort of difficulties that have been happening, um, mm -hmm. and there have been a few over the last few weeks and months uh, inside the Scottish government. Um, I think, you know, has just made people think that maybe it's not all, you know, one side good, the other side bad. Uh, and that perhaps there is a bit of a third road here, which is actually having, you know, people in government, both in the UK and in Scotland, who want to use government to the advantage yeah. of the people rather than just to pursue their own party policy and position. Well, I think you make a good point about, you know, the, 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 the purpose of government and the purpose of parliament, because I think, you know, a lot of people probably questioned the validity of the Scottish Parliament, what's it actually achieved in the last 20 years. I think you can say that for the last 14, it has been predominantly about, you know, the Scottish independence, constitutional debate. Um, you know, you look at the, the domestic agenda and we've got issues with your own crisis, education, um, you name it. I think there's, there's been things that have been kind of overshadowed. And I think people are starting to kind of think, you know, whilst they might support the idea of independence, it's maybe not for them right now. And we need to get our own affairs mm -hmm in order for a domestic level before we, we, we be looking at and certainly people that I talk to are saying you know 14 years you know talk no delivery from them at the expense of my kids education um, and, and, and where we are as a country and, and I do feel that something's changed and that kind of brings me to my next question about Anna Sarbo the new leader of the Scottish Labour Party and I mean I think for the last couple of weeks we've had some great media coverage people starting to look at us in a different a different light and it feels different and I don't think that's just um, blind ambition on my part and, and hope that we you know overturn the, the Conservatives but I do feel that we're on, a, we're on the cusp of something here. people are starting to look at us again or we're seeing it being a bit more credible we've, we've got to build that trust with the electorate I think 
Um, but I, I think he's doing the right thing. Of course, he's paid his market down and said he's going to take on Nicola Sturgeon in the South Side of Glasgow. I mean, this is a, to me, this is the start of the bold Labour Party that I remember, where we need to start get, you know, start being a bit more kind of bold and put ourselves out there and really show the people has got what we're about and what we can do going forward, and not just a kind of past historical record. What we should take on the Scottish Labour Party and kind of where we are and stuff. Well, I think the, the the signals from Anasawa, you know, are incredibly positive. Uh, he, I think he is, I think he's got his uh, finger on the pulse. Yeah. Um, he, I think people in Scotland are deeply worried about their jobs. They're worried about the state of the education system. Um, they are, they've been worried about the pandemic, but they're now yeah. aware that all the problems that were building up in the Scottish Health Service before the pandemic yeah. are still there and back then amplified by the pandemic because there mm. were you know, such terrible waiting times for cancer treatment and so on. Absolutely. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I think he's, uh, from that point of view, he's got a finger on the pulse. And the important thing is not so much um, that uh, Scottish Labour says the right things, but it, uh, but it has the right things to say. Yeah. Um, and genuinely believes them. And I, I, I was really heartened by the education comeback plan that he launched uh, yes. on Monday the 15th of March, where he uh, has, you know, I, clearly had thought about what needed to be done. Yeah. Something in it to address these important issues. So the idea that individual pupils will get a personal uh, assessment plan that will help them recover from any of the psychological and educational damage that they've suffered over the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. The idea that, for example, probationer teachers will get a guarantee that they will finish their probations pro probation properly and that that issue will be addressed. Um, the idea that we will use the summer holidays for a, a comeback campaign that engages young people in outdoor activities and sports mm -hmm. and arts and culture and so on, uh, making good use of the summer break. The national tutoring programme that he's proposed for Scotland, which I think is long overdue and yeah. desperately needed for certain children from certain families. Um, you know, all these ideas and more, I think, will make a, a, would make a real difference. And, and people will react to the substance, yeah. not just the message, but the substance of this. Um, and I think be able to compare what he is saying and what his team are saying. Um, with what has been a very underperforming team of ministers uh, in the Scottish government. I know that people across Scotland, at least you know, a decent number of them, respect the first minister in regard mm -hmm. to she, did, she does divide opinion, but there are you know, sections of the population that regard her as hardworking and reliable and yeah. so on. But the, the, the truth around it is that it's a really poor ministerial team. They're consistently <laughs> underperformed. You know, the, We've not got the highest drug deaths in Europe for no reason. You know, really yeah. underperforming ministers dealing with that issue. We've got shocking performance in, in, in education. We've slipped down the international education league tables. Mm. Minister after minister in education has been appalling. And yeah. nobody's been sacked. Uh, they're all still around. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and, and I doubt if most people in Scotland could even name the minister in charge of the economy. So... You know, I think I, I think if if an ask can prove that he's more than a good speech, that he's got substance, but also that he's got a strong team around him yeah. who could actually become good ministers that would make a difference for Scotland, then I think that would make a, a real comparison with the current Scottish government in, in the past 10 years, where mm. pretty much they've had their eye off the ball, too busy planning referendums and not really thinking about policies well, a little. Well, that's uh, it. Well, that's, that's, it. that's, I mean, that's been the problem. Well, that's it. And, and this morning I read in the Herald that they want to have um, <clears throat> the whole Ford's SMP for Indy Ref 2 on the electoral ballot. And it's just, you know, you think yourself, guys, come on, it should be recovery, not referendum. And I think your, your, your point about Nicola is, is, is a good point. I think a lot of people seem to like her. And in some respects, it's hard not to like Nicola on a personal level. I think she's a good communicator. And I think she's shown that through the, the pandemic. And, and I think a couple of other guys have probably said that as well, like Alison Campbell, and whatnot. Um, but Right, in terms of the calibre of some of the ministers at the moment, I mean, even John Curtis himself has said, you know, who's there to replace? If you look at the calibre, who's come up with the ranks? And this is why we need to have a strong team around and ask to demonstrate that we're actually quite capable in our, in our vision and in, in our delivery. 
going forward and, and, and that will resonate well with the Scottish people. I've always said from day one when people were saying the Labour Party is over in Scotland. <laughs> but a PR guy trying to do too much spin here, but the party ain't over. And I think we're starting to see now that, that they are we are coming back. People are starting to see a different party. It's more professional, hopefully tighter on message, but a bit more discipline as well. What I'd like to see. Well, also just more in touch, you know, I think that's critical too. And I think at times, you know, we've looked over 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 um uh many years now you know we've looked a bit out of touch uh, a bit more interested in ourselves than than, than the people of scotland yeah. a, a bit too angry at the voters yeah rather than really looking to ourselves and seeing what had to change um and you know at times when we've had a good day or the SP or the tories have had a bad day you know a bit too much celebrating and not actually just you know dealing with the issue at hand and, yeah. and having a concrete a concrete uh, policy uh, and an approach that that you know touched touched people's fears and, and their yeah. hopes. Um, yeah. you know, and I think to me, people in Scotland will people in Scotland, like anywhere else in the world, they will mm. vote for governments that they believe have the most ambition, the best vision for the country. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Labour needs to stand for that again. You know, we yeah. need to say. That we will stand up for Scotland. Um, they will, we will stand up for the people of Scotland. We'll also change Scotland when we want it. When it needs to be changed. Yeah. Um, and and crucially, um, that that fundamental message that I think Anas has been trying to get across that in 2019, sorry, in 2021, Scotland needs a recovery, not a referendum. You know, yeah. it's it, it, this is this is what I would you know, you know I would say it was basic Scottish common sense. Yeah. Um, and I think we would really be. Um, you know, really in touch with people if we get across that message. The idea that, you know, the, the, the Scottish government are not able to organise exams for our school children this summer, yeah. but that they won't organise a referendum in the yeah. next few months, you know, is completely bonkers. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, and I think your average person in the street in Scotland knows that that is bonkers. Yeah. They should be concentrating on getting the schools open, getting exams for our kids, getting those cancer waiting times down, mm. and then building the businesses and the jobs that will give people some secure employment in the next few years. And instead, yeah. they seem to be proposing that sometime before the end of the year, we're going to have a referendum. Yeah. And it's going to divide us again. Um, and it's going to divert all that government attention and energy. A critical moment in, in coming yeah. out of the pandemic. All that government attention and energy. 100% of it. On, on on trying to win a referendum. It's, no, no, you're absolutely right. And I think you know, timing's wrong, the idea's wrong, yeah. priorities are wrong. And I think Scottish Labour could be really in touch with people if we if we manage to uh, to get on the right side of that argument. Well that's interesting. And, and on that basis, John, do you think the SNP are now out of touch with people of Scotland if this is what they're pursuing or do you think they doesn't matter? This is their their main policy, this is their only real policy. Do you think this is all matters to them, or do you find they're out of touch thinking this is what people want to see? Are we are we seeing a government, um, quite frankly, that's starting to kind of go down? Um, uh, you know, we're looking at the inquiry with Alex Salmon, Nicholas Sturgeon, that's had an impact on how people view them. The brand is being affected. Are we starting to see a party that can no longer, is ineffective, essentially? Well, I think they've had problems, I think they have had problems in government in Scotland for for some time, uh, that, that, but that those problems have not resulted mm. in reduce, in their level of support reducing. Okay. Um, and uh, the blame for that lies with the opposition parties. You know, they should be more effective. The media scrutiny, or Civic Scotland, the voices of Scotland yeah. should be more should be clearer on this. Nobody in Scotland should be tolerating. The decline in educational performance yeah. that we've seen over the last few years. Nobody in Scotland should be should be tolerating the rise in child poverty. Nobody in Scotland should be tolerating the right the, the, for example, missing the cancer waiting times every mm. year. But there has, I think, been a there's been a culture developed in Scotland over the last few years where it is people feel um, uh, they feel challenged in challenging the government. It's quite it's a difficult environment. Um, yeah. And, and I hope that coming out of the pandemic, people will realise that they need to speak up. You know, if they have got concerns about yeah. the Scottish government is running education or health or you know the 
the the the, the lack of an economic strategy uh, or the rise in child poverty. Mm. People across Scotland who care about these issues need to speak up. Yeah. You need to say enough is enough here. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and the opposition, in my view, have to get more effective yeah. uh, at explaining what the alternative is. Not just complaining and being aggrieved, yeah. but actually explaining what the alternative is and showing that there is an alternative. And I think if you do that, then you can capture the public imagination yeah. and uh, things can start to change. I completely agree, because I think for too long as a, as a party in opposition, we've often said, you know, that's not good, that's not good enough, but for actually giving any follow-up or saying this is what we would do as an, an alternative, and, and, we, and we need to be saying to people, this is what we would do if we were in power, if we were in government, start talking as if you're a government in waiting or we were in third place. But I think for the Scottish Labour Party, that's the problem we've had to be with our confidence dented, we've lost our way, we've been caught up in the constitutional debate, but I do feel now, and again, it's very early days, but I do feel that something's changing, something feels different. Um, you know, I talk to my clients, people I know who are broadly supportive of the SNP, saying, given the way things are with the pandemic, I will not be voting in May. Uh, I just won't vote SNP because I think it's about recovery, not referendum. So on that basis, I actually do think the SNP are now starting to become a bit more out of touch with the business community, with some of the people that maybe were some of the strongest supporters. I'm not saying they're necessarily going to vote for Labour, um, but certainly I think um, their motivation isn't to vote at all. Um, which is, is, is quite an interesting thing in the moment, I think, you know. I think we also need to be very clear, though, that we, we're, we're, we're also uh, angry at the state of the UK government and what we, you know, the Tories are not the alternative here. And I think um, yeah. there's been a sort of casual acceptance uh, in Scotland that the alternative to the SNP was the Tories. Yeah. Um, and I don't accept that for one minute. One no, minute. do I. I, I honestly, in, in Scotland... I, I really, I really think you know, um, a strong Scottish Labour Party yeah. stands up to the Tories and yeah. to the Scottish Nationals, and it, you know, and we say that principles and values come before this kind of extreme debate between nationalists. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, in terms of attacks, I mean, both parties are obsessed with the constitution. Whether it be Brexit or independence, I find it very hard to differ. What, what is the difference? And they're both obsessed with the constitution, and, and this is where we need to find our voice. As a party on the policies that matter to matter to people, and and people on both sides, you know, I have many good friends who have voted SNP or voted mm. for independence um, over the past decade, and uh, people that I would say share the same values as me. And yep. we need to say to people mm. who have been choosing to vote either for the Scottish Nationalists or the Conservatives um, because of that constitutional divide. Yeah. We need, um, you know, we share your values. Um, we understand that you, some of you, are voting SNP because you think that that would produce a better society and a better community. But actually, we can deliver that more effectively than they can. Yeah. Um, see people who are voting uh, uh, conservative because they're against the SNP, hmm. um, but who might want to see a, a fairer economy and a better education system in Scotland and so on. That we were, we are the party that will deliver that, yeah. um, and and be clear that we stand between these two forces, yeah, and, and we're not going to have a false choice between one or the other. Yeah, um, our choice is to do things in a social democratic, principled, valued way that will be about delivering for the people of Scotland yeah. and not <clears throat> deliver for the political debate that has dominated the past decade. Completely agree, and I think we've been asked that's exactly where we're going to be, and I think that's kind of underpinning his message as well and I think that's something we've not been seeing in Scottish Labour for quite some time is that strong message it resonates with people I mean I remember campaigning in Thingburn or you know Euro Neck the Woods kind of motherwell and, and people would say well I support Labour and I'd maybe come back to Labour if I knew mm -hmm. or well do you know what we're now starting to formulate a basis of what we stand for our our, our policies our principles haven't gone away but we, we just need to convey it to people and say this is what we're about this is the real alternative, and this is what we will do for Scotland going forward. Um, and well, there's some excellent prospective candidates out there. You know, in my old constituency in Motherwell and Wisher, this prospective candidate for Labour, Martin Nolan, a woman of substantial experience, an engineer, worked yeah. on the oil rigs, worked across the world. Um, she's come back to her home community and she wants to serve that community in Parliament. Yeah. Um, I, um, young candidates like Eva Graham in, in, in the north, north side of Glasgow, yeah. an outstanding local councillor, 
somebody who's really part of the future of our party, um, Michael Mara and Dundee, who's joined Danasi's uh, team as, as uh, education spokesperson. Yeah. You know, these are, uh, this is the new face of Scottish Labour. These are, mm. these are people who are coming through, wanting to serve their communities, yeah. wanting to make a difference in Scotland, not just against other people, yeah. and against other political parties, but believe in something and want to change the society that we live in and make it better. And I, uh, you know, I, I feel excited about this, actually. Um, yeah. You know, I, it's the first time in a long time I've looked forward to an election campaign. I think that's fantastic. And that's you know, a really good ring of endorsement by not just a party leader, but a former First Minister of Scotland for Martin and, and, and other candidates. And that's great to hear. It's great to hear that you're excited about the future of the party and the people that are our candidates, because we need that buzz. And I think when you get that buzz, as, as some of us politicals do, you know you're onto something, you've got that feeling that you know, something's going to happen, something's going to change, and, and, and long may it continue. But one of the questions I wanted to kind of touch base on was obviously, um, you know, last week we celebrated International Women's Day, mm-hmm. Mother's Day, and then obviously we had the terrible news about um, Sarah Everett um, and whatnot as well. And, you know, it got me thinking, it really did get me thinking, go, go, what, what is going on with the world and society we live in when women are having to carry keys or pretend to be on a phone because it's dark and they're out there? Surely it's down to us men to kind of lead the change and, 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 and the politician to actually make something happen. You know, we shouldn't be having this as a, as a society. And I just think, you know, as Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, listen to women's voices, what is it, what, 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 what's he going to be doing? How do we change this? Because it's, it's not, um, it's just not right, is it, to be back on? Well, I thought a lot about my mother last week. Um, it was, it would have been her birthday on Wednesday and it, obviously it was Mother's Day on Sunday. And uh, uh, she unfortunately passed away in, in November and uh, um, it's the first time I've spent her birthday and Mother's Day uh, without her around. Yeah. But I was also, I was reflecting on the Im- influence and the impact that she had on me as a young male teenager, you know, yeah. back in the day. I, 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 I lived on a farm, my mum ran a tea room on the farm uh, by the time I was a teenager. And I worked with my mum rather than with my dad. I wasn't, mm. I wasn't made for farming, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> Politics is easier, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and I did work for her in this uh, tea room and uh, um, I learned very early on to, to respect um, her and her values, you know, yeah. in a way that, you know, maybe it's not always the case for uh, for, for for young lads. Yeah. Um, and um, from a very young age, I was very conscious of the the, the you know the, the the need for zero tolerance of yeah. male violence on women. Um, yeah. And uh, ever since I was a student back in the late nineteen seventies, I've taken a very strong stand. Mm. And I, and and that means that means living and breathing that every day. Yeah, and I agree. It means being conscious of yeah. the impact you have in your actions. It means supporting women who feel who yeah. feel as if they uh, need or want support, but also promoting women role models to help women um, and women's confidence and their um, uh, and their own power empowerment, um, rather than guys trying to do it for them. Um, yeah. It means being aware of the scale of the problem, not just in this country where far too many women uh, die or are injured every year at the hands of men, usually men they know. Yeah. Um, but they, I mean, the even more horrendous problems in parts of the world that I visit often where um, the level of violence against women and discrimination against women is, mm. is still, um, you know, decades behind where it should yeah. be. Uh, in the 21st uh, century. So all these issues are really important. And I think the, the conduct of people in public life is essential. You know, I, I my successor might have been um, found not guilty of criminal conduct in a court. Um, but there's no doubt that his behaviour with some of his staff was deplorable. And, no. you know, you cannot... You cannot um, uh, you, you, you can neither find that acceptable mm. uh, uh, um, and behave like that when you're a role model. Absolutely. Neither can you turn a blind eye to it. Um, and I've come across some of that stuff in my life mm. in different roles, and I've and I've always dealt with it on the spot. And I um, and I would do so again. And I, I so I would urge um, women, you know, women obviously, but men is men in particular in positions of power and responsibility. Yeah. Do not tolerate this. Have a zero tolerance 
yeah. um, of any form of harassment, violence, uh, intimidating contact uh, between yeah. men and women. Um, and when you take that stand, act on it, uh, because it's the only way that we're going to change this. I completely agree with that, and I think you know you, you make a good point about your, your you know your success. Because okay, you did say that what he did was illegal, but it was uh, inappropriate. So it's almost a, an omission in its own right as well. But even acknowledge it's inappropriate isn't right within itself. And for me, it's it's this idea that women um, can do something without the fear of something happening. And I've had friends of mine tell me stories about themselves and what they've experienced. I'm just thinking, you know, similar to you, Jack. You know, I wasn't brought up that way at all. In fact. If I'd done anything stupid, I'm pretty sure my mum would have um, dealt with me pretty swiftly, uh, even now as I uh, hit nearly 40. And I'm just, I, I cannot fathom for a second thinking, what are these guys like? It needs to change. If it's a culture thing, it needs to change. We need to have a zero tolerance attitude um, at all costs. And politics, again, you know, we had the Me Too movement, we had the stuff with Westminster. We need to be making sure that happens there as well. If, if, if we're going to the core of it, the policymakers need to be a part of this kind of wider uh, movement as well um, to, to make sure that happens. And, you know, listening to women's voices, I mean, we, we do work with Sherry Blair, who's a friend as well for the foundation, and um, some of the stuff we come across there is just unimaginable. Um, even a woman trying to run her own business, the perception that might happen in a third world country, you're just thinking, my God, this is, this, is, this is utterly bizarre from our perspective, but we still have that here. And I just think, you know, as a country, we've been here before things have happened, there's been a protest, but we haven't really moved on and you know, we need to make sure that we we, we will learn from it this time and actually do do something. So again, maybe maybe it's a case of more women in politics, more women's voices being heard at the top mm -hmm. level to, to change that massive, change that culture, um, mm -hmm. which I think would be would be good to see. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, we had you know when I was first minister, we had an excellent justice minister, Kathy Jameson. Kathy, yeah, uh, you know, outstanding, absolutely outstanding. We had an excellent Lord Advocate, Ailey Shangelini. Yeah. Um, you know, proven prosecutor and leader in the in the in 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 our criminal justice system, uh, yeah. or just, uh, wider justice system in Scotland. Um, you know, some powerful figures who I think you know made a real uh, uh, made a real difference in in those roles. And yeah. uh, you know, th this is it, it is important. I think you know just just mm. as important in, for example, sports. You know, it's yeah. important in politics to have role models you can look up to and. Uh, help you feel empowered, and uh, um, you know, let's let's hope we can get back to that. No, I can really agree. So, before we go, Jack, one quick question: Who's your role model, or who was your role model? Role model is important. So, who was yours? Well, I've, I've probably had a few role models um, over the years in different aspects of my personality and my character and my yeah. uh, um, and, and my working life. I would credit a lot of different people with influencing me. Um, but I had one thing that stuck with me, up, you know, pretty much all my adult life, which was what I called the Auntie Margaret test. And I was, <laughs> could I justify this to Auntie Margaret? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that was, uh, I, I, I've always been very careful with things like uh, expenses, for example, and yeah. you know, these kind of, uh, these, but also, be, you know, being aware when you're in public office. Yeah. But the starting point is to decide what's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. then to work out how to do it, yeah. um, how to persuade people. And sometimes the right thing to do is, um, is too difficult. Mm. And then you have to go back a little bit and compromise because um, that's the reality of public life. Uh, but your starting point should be, you know, what's the right decision here? And can I then persuade everybody to agree with that? And can I actually implement it with the people that I've got around me? And um, so I always, I, to me, thinking about whether or not I could justify what I was doing to my auntie Margaret was a big thing for me. And uh, that was the wee, you know, she was always sitting on my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's lovely. I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's crazy. I'm, I must have you said auntie Margaret. I think, I think you meant auntie Margaret fans. I was like, yeah, I'm with you that one. But um, I think that's great. And I think we should all have an auntie an Auntie Margaret can attest to you. I think we should all have that. You know, you and I just find this to my relative who will go through me. So, no, I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Jack, thank you very much for taking the time to do it. I really yeah. appreciate it. And when we can, we'll, we'll grab a coffee as well. Yeah. <laughs> Sometime soon, hopefully. Absolutely. Totally See you in a bit. Take care. Bye.